Of course, we've got to start with G.I. Joe. I, I'd love to hear about how you landed on the voice for your respective characters, if you were shown drawings of what they looked like beforehand, if there was any sort of direction into certain character traits for them to say a little bit more of this, a little bit more of this, or, or what you, you concluded what you came up with. Um, Keone, would you like to start with that? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm formulating with my heart, yes. digesting whatever He's you're saying. saying. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it takes me longer because I got to retranslate it into it. My <laughs> Yeah. Into Keone. Into Keone. Yeah, right. um, so you go ahead, Mary, because I know I, you're quicker than I am. I, I, I will. Uh, Keone and I have very different thought processes. Um, uh, I've got a little hummingbird or, or, or a rat on a, on a wheel. Run, hamster, run. That's exactly yeah. right. Keone has, a, has an old wise man <laughs> at the top of the mountain. Um, G.I. Joe. I was a young uh, actress and. Um, was of two minds about doing a war cartoon to begin with, because I can't remember what wars were playing out at that time, but there was war somewhere. And uh, I'm uh, generally a pacifist at heart, unless someone's hurting animals and then it all changes at that point. <laughs> but I was teaching ESL in Los Angeles as one of my jobs while I was coming up as a voice actor. I also was a newspaper delivery girl. I had a 25 mile ride, route out in the valley and was an art model at, uh, at uh, Otis Parsons, Art Center College of Design. Yes, sans clothes, for all of you who are wondering. <laughs> Scandalous. Scandalous. Um, so I was cobbling my life together, right? As all actors have to do. And But I loved, loved, loved teaching ESL. I taught thousands of immigrants of English, and that remains a passion of mine to this very day. Um, but this audition came up. And I'd already been Lois Lane on Super Friends, and uh, I was scared to ask permission to leave the classroom, so I snuck in a friend of mine to take over for just a couple of hours uh, and, while I ran off to the audition. Well, it was a popular audition. There was a line going around the block for this audition. And in those days, of course, most um, animated voices Easily 90% of, um, of animated voices lived in Los Angeles. Sure. And so everybody was there. And what happened with me was the great Wally Burr, who, how many here have heard Wally speak at other Comic Cons? Oh, lucky you. That's great, that's great. We know he's passed, but what a gift he gave all of us, particularly when it comes to traveling around these various cons through the years. What a, what a character. So I was called in for a minor role, and um, Wally heard something in me that I think he felt sounded strong and and um, and confident, uh, which translates to a lack of shame, basically, on my, <laughs> on my part. And uh, he kept asking me to be louder and more forceful. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not shy. And so he kept asking me to yell, "Yo, Joe!" over and over and over again. And I kept backing further and further away from the mic. And the next thing I know, I think that last Yo Joe must have done it because that's how I booked the role. And so, from a very minor part that could have been in the in the uh, in, in one episode yeah. in the origin story of, of this particular iteration, here, thirty-two years later, I'm still talking about my friend Lady Jane. So that's my story. That's great. That's great. So I, I love that a lot of the character formulated was just like. Yeah, Mary, could you try one more time a bit more just, manic, just a bit more exactly. insane? Um, and then that's where, that's where this precious, uh, beloved character comes from. Um, meanwhile, Storm Shadow, a man of relatively fewer words. <laughs> well, you know, I, on the other hand, I was raised to do the voice of Storm Shadow because I, I'm a, a war child, so I was born right after World War II. Mm -hmm. That's how long I've been. And because of that, my parents, it was really a booming time, and my parents were busy working. So I was raised by my grandparents. And my grandparents were immigrants, uh, immigrants from Asia, from Japan. And, um, and they influenced me a lot by telling me not, you know, I learned childhood stories about Tom and uh, Dick and Jane in school, but they would bring me home and teach me their childhood stories. And um, and I grew up with characters on the radio like 
I, you probably never heard of, well, Hopalong Cassidy, but Jack Armstrong. Jack Armstrong, all American boy, come out on the radio every day to fight Japs. Well, I was Japanese, so uh, I was always looking for my heroes, but my grandparents were great in that they taught me about our heroes, and that's what I aspire to be, and that's what Storm Shadow comes from. Uh, Storm Shadow comes from, you know, the samurai warrior class from my culture. And so I, I was, you know, I, I learned uh, Dick and Jane in the American, the American uh, spectrum of, of a child story, but I was also fortunate enough to learn the children's story about um, from Asia. And I always wanted to bring that culture and be able to articulate it to people because I love my grandparents so much that I wanted them to understand that they were good people too, that they weren't jacks, you know, that they were Americans and that, but they came from a different culture. So Storm Shadow for me was, was great because I spoke English, but yet I was Asian. <laughs> and I had this, not, and it wasn't mysterious to me. It was this story about my grandparents and the stoicism of how they had to deal with life in America at that time, which was really, really hard. They really worked hard for me. And uh, I wanted to bring that culture out. And during the time we were doing G.I. Joe, uh, that was a period of a lot of uh, conflict and, and contradiction in our society. If you remember this time of the civil rights and the Vietnam War. And so Joe kind of like reflected, you know, the issues of society, whereas you had Hanna-Barbera, everybody was talking like animals. And the dogs and cats were talking in English. Or these were like people who were fighting the evil enemy and fighting the contradictions within themselves. And I think that that's what, you know, I couldn't, people like Mary and then the other characters like Frank Welker and Michael Bell, they were really skilled and I thought how could I contribute well I wanted to I said I nobody can do me better than me nobody can do my parent my grandparents better than me they can be great as characters but I can be great as a specific concept and so that's what Storm Shadow came on and instead of it being a literate description of the character it became more of a uh, what do you call it? a kinetic thing that I could bring? Uh, not uh, I would. And you, you know, in, in the English language, it's very literate. It, 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 you know, it comes from Europe, and it's a very literate society where they explain everything. Well, Star Shadow would explain something maybe in a sound like. Huh? <laughs> uh -huh. No. Uh, you know, which, which, which would be more like, and I could bring that kinetic energy to the show, which during that period was really, really uh, significant because you had people like Martin Luther King making speeches, uh, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, free at last. It was like, it was not only the words, but it was the sound that went along with it. And during that period, we had great music. We had the Beatles. You know, we had uh, the blues that came out from like from Chicago, Muddy Waters. You know, and uh, and sound was just as important as words. So I I think GI Joe was great because Yo Joe is not literally you can't define it. You know, but you knew its meaning. You know. Uh, so I think that touched a lot of people growing up in America at that time too, who weren't, who were not so interested in verbalizing and intellectually arguing, debating, but fighting with spirit. And so I think uh, Storm Shadow kind of combined, you know, and it may, brought it to fruition for a lot of people. And like you know, I, I love, I love the uh, Roadrunner. And, Wiley Coyote, <laughs> but, but I think G.I. Joe had a lot of more significance to young, more than young men, I guess, you know, 
young young guys at that time and more significance is a more meaning in that sense I told you there was no wise man yeah, <laughs> only, only, <laughs> right it's good to, if you get answers like that to every question you can take all the time you need. Yeah, that, was, that was gorgeous one one thing i want to point out that i think is important and uh, uh, ties in with what you were saying Kyoto, is that wally burr did something different right uh when it came to his casting choices from what uh, most casting directors and most directors, most production companies were doing at that time. And that is, he didn't cast white actors to play non-white roles. And this uh, only recently has that come to the fore. And this was 30 years ago. And Wally was, Wally Burr was the youngest tank commander in the US Army, as we know, 17 years old, he was commanding a tank lie to get into the military. And so he was a military man, and regardless of where he was raised, and I know the word he was raised, he was exposed to people from all over the world, and he gave us that gift. Uh, we were talking a second ago about uh, about the act of, of screaming yo Joe and what, what that means, how often, how often that happens. That, of course, is one of the trademark elements of the G.I. Joe cartoons, the sheer amount of battle cries throughout um, like really frequently, needless to say, uh, and not always running into battle. They that could be like wrapping up an internal staff meeting. It's you know, yo Joe, get it? Um, want to make a point at the office water cooler? Yo Joe, go around. Um, here in New Jersey, I think we should probably do that when we're trying to make left turns. We scream, yes. so, uh, and make that happen. Can can either of you estimate the amount of times? that you feel like you recorded some version of Yo-Jo or Cobra! Along those lines. Do you remember how many episodes we did? No, I didn't do as many as... I mean, in total... You did about 53, I think. I did 53, but the show itself ran for 80-some-odd episodes. It was something like that. 80-some-odd episodes, so it has to be twice an episode. (laughs) At least, yeah. So that's 160 times, but we've easily yeah. done it a thousand times since then. Sure. No. Hey, hi, I'm sure. I've, I've heard your voice singing out among the, the crowd here. Yes, even. exactly. God bless you for that. <laughs> um, so so G.I. Joe is a product of the 80s in, in a lot of ways, um, and uh, in preparation for talking with you two, I was recently re-watching some really early Rise of Cobra series, like a little mini-series that sort of kicked things off. Um, and was really surprised that almost immediately after Lady J is introduced to the character Shipwreck, he's kind of hitting on her, like immediately. She, she met Lady J sort of sidesteps it pretty quickly before, yes. you know, the kids watching at home start to catch on, like, what's happening right now? Um, but, but it was definitely the sort of thing that's, a, that's an easy uh, HR violation of the G.I. Joe's team now. Were, were there ever lines of dialogue for either of you that, that you would come across, especially as you lived with the characters a little bit longer and felt closer to them yourselves? Were there ever lines of dialogue with G.I. Joe or, or maybe even other projects that, that gave you pause that you thought like, are you sure that you want me to say this either because it's not quite what the character is or because there was something, I mean, Keone, you're talking certainly about cultural sensitivity that you're like, I I wonder if there's a different way that we can come to this sure. idea. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I think you've got some strong questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you were talking to me yesterday at dinner? Just wait for the answer. It's going to be so good, you guys. About um, <laughs> approaching the production and saying that's not how it be said, that's not actual point in uh, uh, culturally. And, and so the question is, you know, what kind of conversations have you had with production? Oh. Where you had to, and how and how have you navigated that kind of? Well, I, all I can say is like it's like how I look at life. You know, um, we have the saying when looking at the south, go the other way and look north. You know, when looking east, go and look stand on on the east and look west. So I mean, there. People and in our society today, we seem to look at things uh, in a in, in, in one plus one is two. But I don't know. I was always brought up to look at one plus one is maybe two and a half or three. And children think like that, you know, because you try and reason with them, and they like, no, no, it's not that way. And so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, when I was but when I was was studying performing it and this was so 
when I was doing Joe. Uh, I, I always looked at it. That, I always looked at it in an in a inverted way instead of an outward way. I always tried to look at it different because I wanted to. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you something about Joe. Yeah, Joe. A lot of these guys that I worked with, they were really proficient. They were really skilled, and I wasn't. I was really raw. I was young, beginning. So I was always listening to them, trying to learn from them. And uh, how could I be as good as they were? And But yet, at the same time, how could I be more different? How could I? And, and then it's in any way you go in life, it's like, OK, you have a girl. And you say, I like her, but how can I make her like me? What can I do to make her love me? And so that was always my. You know my my situation. I was always looking at God. They're so good, but how can I be as good? And then how can I be better? Exactly. <laughs> and I think we all learn from each other on the show, right? Oh. Because we were together for so many hours. Yes. We were working on these things. These, you know, shows ordinarily take 23 minutes to do the first read through, and then about an hour to record, and then maybe 15 minutes for pickups at the end little, to fix little mistakes and so forth. Uh, G.I. Joe would take six hours to record. It was nuts. It was nuts. I, 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 I love kind of the distinction between us because I um, work as a dialect coach also. Yeah. And so in my world, I have to uh, be extremely precise with the notion of language. And when I am working as, as Lady J, I liked everything she had to say because she was strong and brave, you know. Yeah. She really paralleled who I was a lot, right? Um, but there are things that are said, things that are written in other projects that I work on that are offensive to me. And I know Kyoto's encountered that as well. And, um, and so it's been my job as the employee to go to my bosses and say, okay, see, you, everybody else in this play has a name except for the two non-white characters. Why don't they have names? Why are they character number one and character number two? Well, we don't know what their names are. Then I go on the internet and find out what their names are. There's a play that takes place in actual history. Also recently, I've been working with um, playwrights who, for some reason, feel like they can use the, the R word. I think we all know what the R word is in their, in their um, writing. And I've been um, um, very active in um, causing change in that area. And in that case, in the case of the use of the R word, I don't care if they fire me. Because I, just, I won't allow it. So sometimes you have to give, 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 give. On, on Grimm, as I yeah. had an on-camera role on that show, but also was the dialect coach, so the series dialect coach. So I was with him through the entire series. I'd write production and I'd say, so if you'd like the correct version of what it is you're doing, um, this is what it is, and sometimes they'd say, great, use that, use that, use that. Fine, yeah, use the correct one, that's a great idea, boss. Uh, uh, other times they'd be like, it's the right joke, and I'd be like, copy that, copy that. There's, there's, there's a fair amount of hills that I would die on, but there are more hills that I wouldn't die on. Sure, you know? I, I totally, totally understand. There are a, a lot of words that start with a lot of letters out there, and yeah. so we all need to be retraining ourselves, I think, as, as a people. So like, you know what, we can back away from this, and we can well, walk east and west. That's, there's that's other right. Ways to, uh, I'll tell you exactly what I did with that R word. My sister is developmentally delayed. She's 18 months older than me, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm her executor. Uh, she was married for 40 years to a gentleman who was developmentally delayed. They met in a shelter workshop and had a 40 year marriage, just true love. I mean, he passed and and, uh, and now she's on my watch and that's fantastic. I taped a phone conversation with her where I literally asked her, how do you feel when that word is used? And how do you how do you feel when you see the movies or on television? And so I have this beautiful video of my sister talking on the phone with me on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube actually on Mary McDonald Lewis's YouTube channel. And um, so I'm not, I'm not standing still for it. Sure. And I think if each of us chooses an area, or two, or three, where we're willing to, uh, uh, to fight for kindness, if that's not a contradiction. Right. We could all move the ball a little further down the field. Yeah. Is this boring? 
Go, go. Ah. Okay, you guys okay? I, uh, okay. I, uh, not, not to stay in this place for too much longer, um, and because I don't want to make this about myself either, but I love hearing this story for no other reason, because I have uh, a three-year-old son who's on the spectrum, and at the beginning, that a similar journey in a way, like, well, what's this life going to be for you? So knowing that there are more and more people out there that are fighting for that, that's great. Um, uh, I do want to open it up, yes, to, to questions from the esteemed crowd, uh, although I've got so much I want to talk about, but TikTok is going to happen. But I saw your hand first way in the back. Yes, yes. sir. Hi. Uh, thank you for having the panel. You talk about, and you've had long, wonderful careers, but you talk about what we deal with as far as I hate to use the word PC because I think it gets used. But do you think we're making progress in not just you know the cartoon voiceover world, but also in um, you know all productions? Do you think it's getting better even when we have a nation where it seems to be back to normal? It's a great question. Yeah, not as good as technology. I think technology is <coughs> rapidly advancing. And in that sense, it's getting far better. But still, we need to learn how to, I think, be open and communicate. I don't think we are there yet. And um, we might have the terminology, and we might have, like what you say, political correctness, and how that is defined by certain people. But I really don't know if we do if we're there yet, you know. Well, for one thing, uh, for one thing, I think the concept of the business has to really be questioned, you know. And I think they're doing that in small communities, overall and nationally. But on a on a big scale of things, to me, the Star Wars films today are not even as good as what we had in the fifties and sixties. In the terms of the artistic, you know, uh, concept of uh, of, 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 of philosophy, of, philosophy yeah, the morality of, of the morality, right? That's a great way, or the humanity of certain films, you know. And I wonder if because technology is advancing so far that people are more enamored with technology as opposed to humanity. So I question that, you know. But there are still people doing some great things. It's just that. Technology is so far advanced, it pushes that aside, you know. If a movie doesn't make what the, the, the last Star Wars was considered a failure, but if any other movie made that kind of money, we'd be like, well, I mean, what is going to satisfy you? You know, what should satisfy us as people? So, so then to the point to your question, then in a way that, that we all, that as a people are almost so consumed with the next, the next, the next, the next, the next, and, and technology assisting that addiction in a way that we're not slowing down in a way to, you know, well, like our to brains, simplify, to be nice to each other. For crying out loud. Like our brains are going far ahead, but I don't know if our hearts, our, our hearts need to catch up. And, and what I would say is, uh, I hear uh, the, the plaintive sound of your question and the worry behind your question. My motto is tell a story, save the world. And what I believe, what gets me out of bed uh, uh, in the morning, are my two dogs that need to be walked, but quite separate from that, uh, is, is the fact that um, my job is not to try to save the world. Uh, my job is not to save the world. My job is to try to save the world. And I think these little kindnesses that we can do um, they all add up, you know, and there's so much altruism and heroism in the world. Anytime there's an accident, you see people running toward the explosion. You see people stepping into the icy waters to pull that car out. We are all actually superheroes. We are. It's just that sometimes the villains have louder voices, and remember, uh, if it bleeds, it bleeds. The bad stuff gets uh, 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 put out in the public, amplified. amplified for the purposes of selling papers and keeping the populace frightened and sad. But if we, in our own lives, just just take charge of that, I think in the smallest of ways, keep each of them, keep all of us walking forward. I don't know how it's all going to turn out, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be trying no matter how. You know what I mean? Um, and I do think that we are seeing better stories, as Keone says. We are seeing better stories. 
Certainly on the theater side, I can tell you without the shadow of a doubt, the stuff that's coming up on stages all across America now is 10 times more diverse and, 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 and is at the heart of theater missions all across the country. So we're getting them when it comes to that. You know, we see Hamilton, for God's sakes. Would we have seen Hamilton 10 years ago? You know, that's something that I think has changed. For sure. For sure. Um, yes, sir. Do you have questions? One, can I hear you say no, Joe? And <laughs> one, can I hear you say Cobra? And what would you say is your favorite episode that you did on GNS? The, the inevitable group requests for blowing out your cords, yes. Um, you get, you get, you get, and favorite episodes. You get yeah. to hear the calls at the end of the session, of course, <laughs> as always. Okay. And I like the episode where Flint and I are being so awkward with each other in the aquadome that's kind of taking us up out of the out of the ocean. I think that's so cute and so sweet. Uh, Billy Ratner is a longtime friend of mine. We were friends before G.I. Joe, and we've been friends ever since. So we're friends of 35 years. Uh, as I like to describe it, we are in each other's kitchen. When he comes to Portland, his family, he and his family, they stay with me. When I go to LA, I stay at Billy's house. So we have a very sweet relationship, and that's why that's my favorite episode. That's great. Keone, do you have a do you have a favorite episode? No, because you know, I didn't see Joe and like as uh, I I didn't watch Joe as a receptacle. I was Joe as a participant. So for us, it was like a great big family, you know? So it was a continuous thing that was happening all the time. So I can tell you, I don't know about my favorite episodes, but I can tell you my favorite moments with different people in the show. And like when I met like with Rob Paulson and Corey Burton, they, they were young actors at the time, young, and they didn't know where their lives were going. And me too, and I was with, that we were young men, we were in the whole Hollywood uh, group trying to find our way. And we didn't know if we would make a living doing this. So I, those are the moments that were so wonderful. Meeting a young Rob Paulson and a young Corey Burton, and then working with a master like Frank Welker you come to the studio and you like just be mesmerized with their work and just have the kind of uh, can, the kind of uh, stimulus that as a young actor, you know, this was your life, this was going to be your life and you were on the road and you would do Cobra, you know, you know, that's what, that's what it was. It's not something that you can ask me to do. It's a, something that I live, you know, because some days we wouldn't work. And, you know, we wouldn't have any pay. And we would come in and we would want to kill someone. <laughs> so this is what I can tell you about. I can tell you about. And when I say to you, I cannot kill you. <laughs> you know, it was some kind of fraternity that I had that was so important and learning from these masters you know we got lucky yeah we, we, we were very lucky because we got to continuously be, be with each other for many for a, a long period of time and to work with a, 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 a I don't know if I can say great but a really a, a, a sensational person like Wally Burr who was unique in his own way he was the director and the boss I would say. <laughs> You know, and uh, to work with somebody like that, uh, those had more meaning to me than each individual story. You know, I can tell you about like working with Kenny Holiday. Uh, what character did he do? He was Roadblock. Roadblock. Yeah. And I, I knew Kenny from New York off Broadway. And he was struggling as a young actor. He was one of the first black actors that had any recognition in New York. And it just made me cry watching him perform on stage because I knew what he was doing. And so, you know, I knew what the struggles behind him that he had in order to become a lead actor on off Broadway. Not even on Broadway. They wouldn't let him on Broadway yet. He was doing off Broadway. And we came up during that time, you know. So those are the more important things to me than the story of the episode. It was like we were family. And one side of us would be Cobra, 
the other side would be the Joes. You know? <laughs> you know, we were with Arthur, Arthur Burghardt, and Chris oh, Latta, Chris and they were with Michael Bell. You know? And so, like, they sat on one side of the table, we sat on the oh, other. Oh. You know? More yes. huh? Right, right. right. And, we, and it was a wonderful experience. That I can share that with you. <laughs> you know? That's what I can share with you. That's what Joe, G.I. Joe, was about. And that's what Cobra, you know? We had our brothers and sisters and our enemies. <laughs> do you do you find I, I I think it's wonderful to hear so many stories about uh, about the the experience of just going through the process and the family that emerged as a result. Do you or have you found that same feeling on other um, animated projects? Uh, I, I mean, there are so many wonderful professionals out there, and so many that are probably a little sketchy in some cases. Um, and and this is I'm partially steering this in a little. Way uh, Keone specifically that we've been talking about Star Wars a little bit, and mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a big Star Wars Rebels nerd, and you were on uh, that show as, as Commander Sato for a little while. Uh, if the experience working, say, uh, with you know folks like Dave Filoni in Lucasfilm Animation, if that's uh, a rewarding experience, or if it's different because you were all like in the trenches at the same time as, as younger actors. Well. You know, as I said before about technology, with technology comes corporate structure. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's really rough to balance the line, you know, like corporate economy versus, you know, culture and artistic intent. And you always got to balance that. And I come from the generation, we didn't balance that. But, you know, I come from uh, like Lee Strasberg, the Europeans like Berkowski. Anthony Nartot, who rebelled against corporate structure. So, if you're working for Disney, <laughs> you're working for a corporation. You got to do it Disney's way, or you don't do it any other way. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I feel like for like guys like Filoni and the guys who do do all the Star Wars stuff, they're working for Disney. Now, I don't care what you say. That's you, you're working for people with suits. You know. And that's why what Mary says about the theater, yeah, because in the theater you don't have that. And when we did Joe, who we were doing with Sunbow, but Sunbow never, I never met anybody from Sunbow, did you? They would never come down and tell us what to do. We did it on a daily basis. And, and uh, they were simply happy with the product. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they're not happy with the product unless it reaches a certain uh, corporate standard. So I question that. It, you know, I, I love the people that, uh, at, at, at uh, Star Wars, the Lucas is, uh, they're wonderful, beautiful, kind people, but they still have to work within a corporate structure. So so then... Well, you... that's like with G.I. Joe, we were like, we didn't have that corporate sure. structure. Sure. We're, we were kind of more free. Yeah. So th is that inherently in, in your mind, is that a bad thing or is it more like, I feel bad for the folks like Filoni or whatever who are... No, I don't feel sort of bad one for... Well, no, I don't feel bad for him. In, in that, <laughs> I'll, I'll clarify that, that he's someone, an example of someone, and probably there's there's lots of these folks that have one, one foot handily in the artistic world because I get to deal with, with you guys and the voice performances and really sort of pull out the arts and... Uh, work with the team, but then have have a foot on the other hand. Like, and now I've got a meeting with someone very important. Said, let me straighten my tie and build. I hope this goes well. Um, which is sort of a tricky position, I would think, to be in for, for some Absolutely. of those yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I did Deadwood for, for three years, and Deadwood got canceled like that. And people wonder why. People say, why was Deadwood canceled? It's stupid. It was the best show on TV. Well, because the corporation couldn't handle it anymore. They didn't want to be dictated to by the artistic side. And it was ruled by one man, the creator. And he said, no, I can't work that way. I can't work, you know. I, I, we did, we're shooting episode five, and he said, you know what, that episode one we did a couple months ago, I gotta reshoot it, a scene from that, because it doesn't make sense now. And corporate says, well, you know, that costs a lot of money, Dave. You know, we gotta get the costumes, the actors back, the sets and everything, and so, but he says, but it, it, it'll make better sense if we do it this yeah. way. It'll be more honest, more true. And if you know about Deadwood, Deadwood's attempt was trying to be honest all the time and true. And that took precedence over the 
particulars, you know. Sure. So, so I mean, I don't know. Anybody think that this Star Wars shouldn't have been sold to Disney? I think they should. Well, I, <laughs> what? You guys think they should? I, I don't think they should. They, they think they should not have. No, they, you agree with me, right? They should never. I don't think so. I don't think it should have been sold. I think they should have, like, George should have just done his own thing. But now he can't. Right? So I, we could roll this into a whole other panel. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys have feelings about that too. Actually, yeah. Right? You guys sure. have feelings about that too, right? Sure, because that's that's what it means to be a fan of this stuff, right? And I know that, especially with, with Star Wars out there, holy smokes, it is a crazy place in the internet right now for, for Star Wars. Um, but, but that could translate for so, so many different fandoms, and, um, you know, not to get too, oh, uh, about it, but that's the whole reason that we're all here, and why we're in this room, and right. walking around a rink, uh, you know, talking to all these people that we're, that we're so excited about, and, and you too, and we're so lucky for that. Um, uh, one more question there in the back. I know we're, we're running out of time. Yes, sir. Um, so, G.I. Joe, it, it's had multiple incarnations, I believe. And uh, if it were to get re another reincarnation were to kind of in modern day, would you take back up your role and how you think it would take another direction? Well, if G.I. Uh, Joe were created again today, I would have to audition for Lady J because all of us would have to audition for our roles because uh, there's a very reasonable question around what's happened to your voice in the meantime, mm -hmm. right? Can you still bring it? It's a reasonable question. So uh, once I won that audition, <laughs> <laughs> got my role back, yes. Um, uh, how would it have changed? It would be, uh, unfortunately, it would be racier, which I wouldn't approve of, because I think it's much more important to have it not be so gendered, just have it like we were, a, a, you know, a military family, a military team. And I think that the um, women would probably be more fetishized, meaning uh, you'd see more cleavage and, and such, because that's what's happened to female superheroes, which I also don't approve of. Uh, let's circle back. I made my living having my clothes off, so it's clearly not about that. Uh, it's, it's about uh, the objectification of women, which has been on the rise for many, many years, unfortunately. And it's, um, it is, in actual fact, a response to women's rising uh, power and influence in our culture. So there's an opposite rise that seeks to, you know, put that down. I would advise all of you men to allow us out, allow us to rise up because we're going to save your ass after all this trouble you put us in. I love you. I, I do. I love all of you. Um, so that would be the difference that I would see based on what I see around us in terms of pop culture. But I would I would return to Lady J in a heartbeat. I can be young and strong again. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't. I don't know if they should be GI Joe again because. I no wait. I I see the cashier's uh, check. No, no, no. <laughs> but what I think that the following GI Joes and I've worked on them. Uh, you know, I did. I got old and I had to play Star Shadow's father, oh, the, hard oh, oh, no. the hard master. Yeah. So um, I don't. But I don't think, and I've never seen it. G.I. Joe movie all the way through because I watch it 10 minutes and I go, that's another thing. And it's like, and it's like, I don't think you can do G.I. Joe again because it's like, you know, the New York Yankees doing the mantle, Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris? You can't bring that back. And that was, to me, real, with Pete Rose and those guys, that was real baseball. Today, and they're good, they're great, they're, you know, uh, technology, uh, sports. Psychology and sports uh, physicality, and they're wonderful. They could do great things, but they could never be Mickey Mantle or uh, or Maris or, or you know or uh, Thurman Munson. Uh, I, I'm sorry, those were like baseball players. You know what I mean? So like the GI Joe I see today, they they're pretty, they're wonderfully, they got great bodies, but uh, they were. <laughs> they Sean Flipper sitting right here. No, they should do something else, you know? I can play that part too. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you agree, but maybe I'm too old or old school. You know, but old school is what G.I. Joe is. I'm glad to yeah. see young young folks still enjoying the show. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. I uh 
I'm, I'm so grateful for your time as, as uh, I, I could go on for three more hours. I've got so many questions. Yeah. Um, and we'll be at the booth if you want yes, to stop by. Yes, there. please do. If, uh, this is a taste of the awesomeness of, of these two. So for crying out loud, go on over and visit them. Um, I, uh, I promise you I will never be able to uh, hear someone scream Yojo or Cobra again and not have, have all of this come through. Um, I think that uh, we have covered a lot of really important social issues, which is great. A lot of my Sorry. questions were about that. No, no, I, not at all. Um, I think that it's important uh, on behalf of all of you. I would like to thank you and say, now I know. And knowing is half the bell. That's really all I wanted to say. That was a long-winded way of getting her to say knowing is half the bell. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Kieran Young and Mary McCann. So I'm going to do it once, and then because we're all Joes and Cobras, uh, I'm going to invite all of you for the for the second Yo Joe, okay? So, and that, that Joe, note how that Joe kind of extends at the end, all right? So I'm going to do it, and then you guys are going to join me, okay? You ready? Yo Joe! And...